Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Great to see you guys here. Uh, my name is Asim. I work as a senior product manager with uh, Cloud Security View at Akamai for Asia Pacific and Japan. Today, I'm going to be talking about a recent product launch uh, called as Kona Site Defender and the new uh, key features that we have introduced with the product uh, with a special focus on uh, API security. All right, so, so Kona Site Defender 5.0, as you know, Kona Site Defender uh, is an Akamai Enterprise class product which protects your websites or digital assets against uh, web application as attacks as well as the DDoS uh, attacks. So with KSD 5.0 or Kona Site Defender 5.0, we have few key features starting from API protection. So let's uh, dig deep into what is API protection. So before we go into the API protection, let's take a minute to understand why APIs are so important, right? So th these are some interesting facts that gathered from API G's 2016 set of uh, API uh, report. So they ran, uh, they ran an analysis uh, for all the API traffic that goes over their platform. And when they ran the analysis, you know, it was very evident that few successful businesses, or all the successful businesses rather, had few things in common. Uh, and how they use APIs and how they adopt towards APIs. So the first one that you look at the left hand side, you know, they saw that majority of the businesses or the, rather the successful businesses experience non-linear growth, meaning they grew very rapidly because they made APIs very, very easily consumable by the third party uh, vendors and developers. Right? APIs are building the digital uh, ecosystem around us. So uh, whether like it or not, majority of the innovation on API side is not coming from in-house, but rather the third party developers and the outsiders. And the key interesting fact is that it's not only about how many uh, domains or the applications you have APIs on. The, the most successful businesses run the high, very high volume of API traffic. So in terms of adoption across the industries, you see the majority of the adoption for APIs is towards B2C. That's where your mobile app and a lot of uh, you know, end consumer apps uh, drive the uh, traffic and the, the workflow. Now, uh, the second uh, adoption comes towards uh, B2B, where you have par your third party vendors or the, you know, the application developers working with that. And then finally, very, very less portion uh, of the API adoption is internal, you know, which is used for your uh, internal IT infrastructure or any other automation uh, purposes. In terms of the industries that use APIs heavily, you know, you see media, retail, and financial services being the topmost because of the mobile first strategy that we see. Majority of the e-retail and e media customers especially are moving to towards mobile first strategy now. B2B, you see a lot of adoption on technology because that's where uh, the, the process standardization as well as the uh, infrastructure management or the automation comes into play and then information services and telcos. Right. Even at Akamai platform, we observe, you know, this, this gives you a uh, snapshot of the traffic analysis that we did for the APIs across our platform. And very, one thing very interesting to note is uh, this yellow, uh, sorry, the orange circle here denotes the number of uh, the sites that uses uh, APIs on Akamai. You can see it's only 4%, but the traffic that they generate is pretty huge. You look, overall, they generate 21% traffic. So, so very small set of APIs generate a lot of traffic, which is a key thing to understand how APIs work because they are used to deliver very rich content across the internet. So even though before KSD uh, 5.0 Akamai did not have a specific module to look at the APIs, customer worked anyway sending us a lot of traffic on the API platform. And hence the reason why we thought of building a specific module which handled API security. Now let's take a look into the current state of APIs security, how it spans out. So this is unfortunately the, the real face of API security at the moment. Just like this door which gives you the incomplete protection, the API protection across the industry is, is almost in the same state. To the fact that API security is now included in OWASP to, to, uh, 2017, OWASP Top 10. Earlier APIs never featured in that, but 2017 RC of OS top 10 category has API security as one of those uh, important factors. So 
Let's look at the different security vulnerabilities, uh, uh, the targets on the API, as well as the outcome or how you know, the attackers leverage that. So at the core of the API, or the heart of the API, is where you want to protect your data. You, you have things like message integrity as well as confidentiality being the core, uh, core thing that you want to protect. Right? Now, what it leads to is you have malformed documentations where the data structure goes for a toss. Then you see in, insufficient encryption where you, know, uh, you see attacks like man in the middle and the data, data exposure happens. Then you have authentication and authorization flaws. So uh, things like session hijacking, if you're using API uh, token or API keys, if they're not being you know, randomly generated or have certain weaknesses that can be replayed, you will see the misuse of uh, the API tokens. Then majority of the businesses does not pay too much attention on rate limiting the concurrent connections to the APIs. Because APIs deliver so much rich content that very less number of the API properties, you know, as we saw, can bring a lot of traffic or a lot of transactions. So if you do not pay a good attention on how many concurrent connections that you want to have on your APIs, you are going to be DDoSing your own infrastructure. Then you see, uh, you know, using the different tools like Fuzzers, uh, we see exploitation of the schema or the data structures, uh, you know, just like we have for any other web applications. With uh, APIs, it goes one step further because now you have much, much richer data. You have your data structures like JSON and XML, which can be exploited with that. Then you have classical parameter exploitation techniques. Just like any web applications, you see uh, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, basically any input where you want to inject something, that is still exploitable on the APIs. So what you need for APIs is a multi-layer security approach, right? And this is also the approach that you will see uh, highlighted in OASP API strategy. So if you look at the o OASP uh, API securing guideline, you will see that it's no longer about just following a single approach of either blacklisting or whitelisting. It's about applying a multi-layered approach, and that's where uh, Akamai has also done a lot of work uh, in this area. So the first approach that we're going to talk about is uh, negative security model, right? So think of negative security model in very plain terms as a blacklist approach, right? You have a certain set of rules, for example, Kona rule set, which is available for the WAF uh, customer as well as Kona Site Defender customers. Now, prior to uh, KSD 5.0, uh, although we were still looking at the XML traffic or parsing that, the, the JSON inspection or the parsing was very limited on WAF. Now, with, with Kona Site Defender 5.0, we have further enhanced our rules to look at the complete JSON parsing. So we are able to you know, uh, inspect APIs at a very deeper level uh, rather than just what we were doing with KSD 4.0. So the negative security model gives you the different, uh, you know, different uh, parameters or, or the set of rules that can be applied uh, to the APIs. So you have things like WAF rule set, which is Kona rule set, which now is further enhanced to look into the API traffic. Then you have API rate control. So if you're using API keys, you can define how many concurrent connections you want to allow on the API endpoint, just to make sure that your APIs does not get uh, DOS or DDoS. Then uh, you have slow post protection. So just the way we provide uh, slow post protection for uh, the regular HTTP post, for example, then same can be applied on the API level as well. So this was about negative security model. Let's take a look into the positive security model, right? Now think of positive security model in a very classical terms as a whitelist approach. So we saw a blacklist. Now let's take a look at the whitelist uh, portion. So what it does is it gives you a flexibility to define your own API structure on Akamai platform. Then you enforce that API structure by, by putting across the request body constraints. And then finally, you are able to you know, get the analysis view of what all requests you see and how to act upon that. So this is, the, uh, this is how you define your API uh, structure and endpoints with the API protection module available in Conosite Defender 5.0. Now, key thing to note is, imagine the, the kind of computing power you can save if you offload that to Akamai platform, rather than you yourself. I mean, majority of the API developers or the applications that you use, you're anyways doing some check and uh, bounce at your level, like input validation. Uh, looking at how much is going to be the JSON element uh, array length. All those things are still being taken care of by you. 
But the benefit that you get out of this is at a massive scale, you can kind of put that on the Akamai platform and don't worry too much about what you apply at your end. So you begin by defining an API name and then you give the API URL, uh, basically define the API endpoint. If you do not want to manually define it, then you have the option of uh, importing the API format using the Swagger and the Babel format. If you're using the API keys, you can define which header has an API key, whether it's present in the header or a cookie or a query parameter. Then, the, then this next screen, continuing on the same thing, uh, this is where you define uh, the overall structure of how your uh, API is. So you can define, for example, it's a JSON format. Uh, what is it going to be the maximum length of any JSON key or what is going to be the number of keys or elements in the JSON? So basically what you're doing here is you're going to put a request or response, uh, basically request constraints here. So any request that comes, now you're going to be checking against that at Akamai platform rather than checking it at your level. So this gives you a lot of flexibility as well as saves you a lot of uh, computing power at your end. You can go more granular when you define the different request methods like HTTP GET and POST and what different parameters are going to be present in the request body, for example, the name of the parameters, what is going to be the length of the parameters, and many, many other uh, you know, features inside. And finally, once you've completed defining your APIs, then you tie that up uh, to the security configuration, just the way you do with uh, web application firewall. So some best practices uh, towards securing APIs. So for, for most of the uh, folks who have uh, focus on security, you know that security always works on defense and depth strategy. So do not use only one strategy to protect uh, your applications or APIs. Use multi uh, defense model as we saw. Uh, very rarely you will find a product or a solution where you're able to define both positive and negative security model at the same time. API module or API protection module gives you that flexibility to to apply both positive and negative security model at the same time. Then uh, you define your uh, API rate limit, how many concurrent uh, connections you want to allow on your APIs. Especially pay attention to the, to the content type and response type, uh, you know, headers, because that's where majority of the exploitation on the uh, APIs happen. Then obviously uh, securing the data in the transit or even at store is, is a very key priority for the organization, so use strong uh, encryption algorithms. And finally, for authorization or authentication, use uh, very well-known uh, mechanisms such as O2Auth, for example. So that was about APIs. Now let's take a look into the other key feature uh, on KSE 5.0, which is multi-tenant operation, or uh, as we call it, uh, multi-security configurations. So with KSD 4.0, or prior to KSD 5.0, customers had access to only one security configuration file. Within that, they will create multiple BAF configurations where they will tie different policies, uh, different host names uh, will be tied to that. Now, while it worked great, it did not give enough flexibility to customers to either provide the role-based access control or it was not very friendly towards the chain management policies against many enterprise customers. Like for mid-segment customers, it pretty much worked fine, but then there were customers which, which had a lot of business units internally, and they faced challenges with chain management as well as the access control. So with uh, KSD 5.0 multi-tenant operation feature, what we're trying to address here is the access control. Uh, you know, it gives you more scalability and flexibility to deploy your uh, configurations because you can segregate them. And, and obviously, change management becomes very friendly. So, uh, so this is how the configuration, uh, multi-security configuration looks like. You can see earlier, if you are familiar with KSE 4.0, you will see that at the root level, you'll only see one security configuration. And within that, you will get the options to define multiple WAF configuration. But with KSE 5.0, you define different access control groups, and you can uh, assign the users to that. So by default, uh, this multi-tenant uh, security configuration has five security configurations, and each security configuration have two WAF policies as well as 10 rate controls. So for the folks who are probably not very well aware of rate controls, they are your uh, line of defense for DDoS mitigation at a command. So imagine, coming from one security config to five, and then earlier you had 
two VAF policies by standard default, now you have 10. And rate controls also increase from 10 to overall 50, because with five configurations, you get 50 rate controls. So you get more flexibility to define your DDoS mitigation strategy based on the traffic and the volume and the nature of the sites uh, that, that are on the platform. Okay, let's take a look into the custom rule builder feature. So while talking to many customers, we got to hear that you know, every time a customer need to create a WAF configuration uh, rule or, or, or any rule in WAF, they were to contact Akamai for that. Right? Whether it's a small or a big rule, uh, depending on what you're seeing, you had no option but to control Akamai professional services and we will help you create that uh, rule. Now with Custom Rule Builder, what we are doing is we are bringing that flexibility or giving that self-serviceability option to you. So customers using Custom, uh, custom Rule Builder can def define uh, or create the basic, basic web rules. It's a very simple UI. Uh, you can define multiple matching uh, parameters as well as criteria here, based on which you can create your uh, WAF rule and deploy it to uh, the staging and the production environment. So instead, if you, let's say, uh, you're looking or analyzing your logs and you see a very peculiar or a specific pattern that is not caught by WAF rules, highly unlikely, but if you see something very specific to your applications, then you may want to create the uh, custom rule. And for that, you don't have to depend on Akamai. You can just uh, go to the KSD 5.0 interface and then create the uh, custom rule by yourself. Ob obviously, if there are many more advanced rules or many options, uh, where you need to deploy a much, much more sophisticated or advanced configurations, uh, you can still leverage a Kamai Professional Services help. Okay. So the next key feature that we added with KSD 5.0 is the modification as well as the enhancement uh, about the overall monitoring as well as the analytics piece, especially on the security side. So earlier, if you are familiar with uh, Kona Site Defender 4.0, you had the option, or you still have the option of security monitor. Now, security monitor is a good data of providing a technical information as well as uh, the business friendly information that it can be consumed by business in a much, much more efficient way. And with, uh, with the new uh, uh, enhancement that we have done with the monitoring piece at Akamai, uh, we kind of try to find the true balance between being Technical, you know, sh showing you what we uh, are good at, giving you the technical in-depth, uh, you know, the view. But also we're trying to balance it with making it more business friendly. So the business owners can, can go and see this dashboard and look at the different things. So we've categorized uh, all of this under the same dashboard. You can look at the different sort of activities. Look, you can look at application security activity, which is happening. You can look at DDoS, bot uh, activity as well. So this gives you some you know, uh, representation about the traffic. So you see what are the different type of application security attacks which are targeted, which, uh, what is the outcome, whether they were an alert or denied based on your configuration. So you are able to view uh, this on real time where you can see uh, the different peaks that you see in the traffic. So for example, if I were to investigate this specific peak here, I could just select this one and the whole dashboard will change to show me the traffic only specific to that particular peak. So that way I can, or a, a technical person can uh, you know, navigate to that and see what sort of traffic uh, was hit on the firewall. Then uh, another, another key thing that we did here is we've categorized that based on the different host names. So earlier you were to select, if you were to look at the host name basis, you will have to go manually select each host name using the CP code then it will show up, but now by default, we categorize uh, the number of attacks uh, you know, based on our different digital properties. So as a business owner, if I own, let's say for example, abc.com and I come here and I see, okay, the number of attacks against my sites are pretty, pretty huge as compared to the rest, then I have something to worry about. So I'll, I'll navigate much deeper into this and find out where that attack traffic is coming from, what's happening. So uh, again, here you see the number of uh, attacks originating from different uh, sources or the di different IP regions. Right. So the last key feature that I'm going to be talking about with KSD 5.0 is SIM integration. So to get the logs from Akamai to feed that in your SIM, uh, earlier 
the architecture was a bit different. So you, you had to open a lot of ports on your firewall. And it was a push architecture. So basically, Akamai will push the logs to you. So if your SIM uh, infrastructure was not scalable enough, if you did not have too many uh, servers in the cluster, there were chances that it will go down because of the, num the number of requests that you receive. Now, with the new SIM uh, integration module on KSD 5.0, uh, we have introduced open APIs that will let you define the interval under which you want to pull the data. So instead of using a push model now, you've, we've gone into a pull model. So in, as an end customer, you will have a flexibility to pull the logs from Akamai. And you can define the interval on that. Right? By default, uh, we, we come with, a, you know, we provide a native integration of the connector with HP ArcSight, IBM QRadar, and Splunk. But since we log, uh, you use syslog format, or Ceph, or JSON format, that can be readily consumed by many uh, SIM vendors there. So this was about what we have seen in, or what we've launched in KSG 5.0. Just to quickly summarize, we saw API protection module, right, which is a free product upgrade. So with K, if you're already using an KSD 4.0, once you move to KSD 5.0, it's a free uh, product upgrade. You don't have to pay for a product upgrade. Yeah, there may be some, some very minimal costs associated with the services uh, to implement that, but it doesn't come with a uh, product upgrade fee. Uh, then we saw about uh, the the SIM that we uh, just saw. Then we saw multi-security configurations where you can uh, segregate your security configurations into different files, and that gives you a lot of uh, benefit in terms of the uh, the flex or gives you flexibility around that. So this is what we are working on next at Akamai. We are trying to make our products as we've already heard. DevOps is a is a bay, uh, you know, moving forward. So we are going to make sure that our products are very uh, DevOps friendly as well. So I'm going to be at booth booth number three. If you want to uh, talk more about uh, DevOps or any other features uh, that we just spoke about, uh, please feel free to come, uh, come, come over and we'll have a good chat. Thank you for your time. OK, with that, I hand that over to Amol. Thank you, Asim. Um, so the next 30 minutes, uh, what I want to talk about is bots, the good, the bad, and the ugly about them, uh, and what Akama is doing to help organizations sort of manage the bots coming to your sites. So what exactly is a bot? A bot is nothing but an automated tool. And this automated tool is used by bot operators to repeatedly perform some type of action on your site. And because it's automated, they can do these actions at much, much faster speed than a human can do. So it's very important to understand what the motivations of these bot operators are and what kind of actions are they doing to your site. So let's, before we sort of go into uh, what Akama is doing to help organizations uh, like yourself, let's talk about what are the industry pain points in different verticals on what uh, things bots are doing uh, to your site. So let's say, for example, you're a commerce company, you're retailing, online travel, uh, you're selling products online. Bots can come in, might be hired or run by competitors to scrape your prices. You might have a sale which where you're selling a limited set of hot products at very discounted prices because you want to acquire new customers. Bots will come in and buy all the inventory at much faster speed than actual humans can. Sure, you are not going to lose revenue, but you are not going to be able to increase your customer acquisition because these bots will acquire the products and sell it in the gray market. If you're a media and entertainment organization, a lot of media companies, uh, they have content online, but they don't charge for the content. 
they, they monetize that content using advertisements or, or by other uh, mechanisms. So if bots are able to come and scrape and continuously scrape your entire content and show it on other sites, then you lose that customer touch point and the ability to monetize that revenue. If you are in the travel sector, you're an airline or a travel aggregator, whenever you uh, look up a fare, you incur a fare lookup fee in the back end with back end booking engines like Amadeus or Navitech. Now if bots continuously come in and look up fare prices but they don't buy anything because they are showing those fares on their own sites, then you are incurring a high amount of cost with no revenue to show for it. And if you're a bank or in any kind of financial services organization, there are data aggregators where, let's say for example, I have multiple bank accounts, I have a trading uh, account, I have an insurance account, I will download this app like Yodel or Mint and I will provide my credentials for my various banking services and this application will now go and retrieve my data and show it to me in a, in a single interface. And uh, that's also essentially exposing a lot of the data that you have. You have no idea how it's being stored uh, by these third party services and so on. Now, some of the use cases which are common across all of the uh, industries that I talked about, credential abuse and account takeover is one, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in the coming slides. Form spam and fake registrations. I mean, if you have the capability where users can create uh, registrations on your site, bots can come in and create a very large number of fake user profiles that's completely uh, polluting your CRM system or any kind of targeted campaign that you're trying to run. Uh, skewed uh, site analytics, a lot of campaigns run by marketing, especially targeted towards online users, is based on the users coming to your site. Now imagine if 50, 60 percent of the traffic coming to your site is not monetizable users, but bots, then that skews up your plans of targeting specific monetizable users coming to your site. And the last and the most common one, which is very IT-centric, is the load on your infrastructure and the increased cost of compute and bandwidth and I.O. that you have to sort of sustain just to serve traffic to bots which are not bringing you any revenue. So now let's sort of dig deeper a bit into the credential abuse use case because that pretty much impacts everybody who has any kind of an e-service or an application on your site. Now the average person and including all of us in the room, we have about 40 to 50 different online profiles, right? We do social media, we do email, we do banking, we make travel reservations online, we have loyalty points online, we, uh, some of the hospitals have medical records online, and so on and so forth. Now if you think about, across those 40, 50 different online accounts that you have, you're pretty much using the same five username and passwords. I'm pretty sure that for a good majority of the people in this room, your Gmail username and password is the same as your LinkedIn username and password, is the same as your Facebook username and password, so on and so forth. Now, this is the vulnerability, the human vulnerability of not, it's not sustainable to remember 40 different combinations of username and passwords that fraudsters, criminals, scamsters are trying to ex exploit by using credential abuse and account takeover. So the way it works, now there are data breaches happening pretty much on a daily basis. Yahoo had half a billion, LinkedIn had uh, 20 to 30 million and so on and so forth. Recently, uh, in India, we have seen a lot of customer databases leave. Now, a fraudster or, or a criminal organization, they will go online either on the dark web or as simple as go on Pastebin and either get a set of these credentials for free or they will pay pennies on the dollar to get it for very cheap. The, the per credential cost is extremely cheap. Now, once they have a, a big cache of credentials, username and passwords, then they will start trying those username and passwords across multiple sites. But the way they do it is they either create their own botnet, which is essentially a large scale distribution of machines all over the internet, which they either control or they can rent. And they start sort of trying to see if these username and passwords work across these sites or not. So just imagine, I mean, we did some research over a 30 day period across the three trillion login transactions that we see, 30% uh, were credential abuse, right? Now, if they are able to see that, you know, this credential is working across these 10 other sites as well. I got this from the LinkedIn breach, but it's working across the 10 sites. They sort of mark that off as successful. 
and they either pass it off to a, another group of criminals who try to then take over the account and commit fraud, or they do it themselves. Now, if I know that your LinkedIn account, which I got from a breach, is now working across 10 different sites, I can log in as a genuine user and then essentially take over the account, steal the data, make fake transactions, whether it's financial, whether it's commerce related, and so on. Now think of another dynamic. If an organization is trying a large set of username and passwords against your site, they might not get any success because the passwords are not the same. But if the login IDs are same as login IDs of the customers on your site, and in a single swoop, if 100, 200, 500 accounts of yours get locked. Because you have an application logic that will lock the accounts after a few failed attempts. Just imagine the havoc it can cause in terms of customer disruption, business disruption. Suddenly your help desk is getting multiple calls, multiple hundreds of calls, because all these accounts have been locked out. So this is a very serious and a major problem uh, that uh, pretty much everybody who has an online application would, would suffer from. So, so why bot manager? Why do you really need a solution to deal with the different sort of use cases that I talked about? And that is where the whole sophistication of the bots really come into play and why you need a solution uh, that can help you manage these bots. Now, most traditional solutions, most traditional web application firewalls, including the one that Akamai has, they look at bots in a very binary way, which means uh, you're either a good bot, so I'll allow you, or you're a bad bot, and I'll probably block you. But that doesn't really work, and, and this is why it doesn't really work. So you have a bot or a bot operator that is motivated to, to perform a certain action, whether it's to steal the data or to do credential abuse. Now, if you identify that bot and you block that bot, the bot operator knows that it's been blocked, it's been identified, and that awareness leads to the bot mutating. And by mutating, I mean they, could, they change their fingerprint, they change where they are coming from, they change the rate at which they are hitting your site, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially, you lose visibility of those bots because now their characteristics have changed. And the bots are back on your site. And then you detect them in a fresh manner if you can, and you, you block them, and you essentially get into a whack-a-mole game. So we firmly believe that it's, it's not about mitigating the bots. It's about managing the bots based on what that bot means to your site. Because we have seen bots uh, which some customers want those bots to come to their site, but there are other customers, depending on your business, that you might not want the bots to come to your site. So what, what Akamai provides is essentially a, a very comprehensive framework to deal with the bot issue. So the first thing we provide is detection. And we'll talk about sort of the evolution of that detection uh, in, in this presentation as well. Now, once you have detected the bots, we provide a way to categorize the bots. Now, the three most common categories are Akamai known bots. So we have a library out of the box about 1,400 known bots. And these are bots that typically announce themselves, like a Google bot or an ERSS feed bot, something like that. So we have already categorized them. We understand their signature. We understand how they uh, format their requests and so on. The second category is customer known bots. So you as a customer can define a bot that you already know of based on a fingerprint or a signature. It could be a partner bot, it could be a bot that has come to your site before and so on. And the third category is the unknown bots, which are bots neither we know about nor you have defined. That means those are the bots that you should be really worried about because they're doing something malicious. Now once you have categorized the bots, we provide a wide variety of techniques just beyond the allow and deny to manage those bots. And the last and the most important is visibility. You need to really be able to analyze what is going on in your environment, what are the different metrics. Uh, if you want to investigate the bots, what they are doing on your site, where they are going on your site, and so on. And I'll talk about that in a second. So let's talk about the management aspect, on what different actions can you take based on the context of what the bot is doing. And I'll talk about it in the context of a few use cases. So let's say you have a legit user, right? You pretty much want to allow that user. You might want to monitor it for some reason, but you want to allow. Simple action, pretty much available in most application firewalls. But what if it's a bot, which is authorized, it's a third party partner bot, but what if you want to slow that bot down? So just imagine that uh, 
either during a certain part of the month, during holiday season, or a certain part of the day, your traffic surges due to the way your business is structured. 5 to 7 p.m. in the evening, people are stuck in traffic, they're on their mobile phones, they're shopping on your site. Uh, or a specific time when people are doing most of their financial transactions, whether they're paying taxes, whether it's, it's time when they're transferring money and paying their bills, etc. At that time, you want to serve the monetizable users at a regular rate, but you might want to slow down the rate at which you are serving these bots, which are authorized bots, which you don't want to completely deny, but you want to slow down. Now, the third one is competitors. People you, who are competing against you, they're scraping your site, or they're trying to do something which is malicious, you can serve them alternates. Now, what you can decide is that, you know what, my main origin, I want it to be top-notch performance, it's an expensive infrastructure, I'll set up a separate cheap origin, maybe in the cloud, with those one of the cloud computing providers, and I want to serve these bots, these specific bots, from that alternate origin. I do not want to load my main origin. Or you can decide that, you know what, I'm going to, to serve them alternate content. So just imagine that you're a site which, is, which has a product catalog with prices. You can choose and say, these bots which I know are scraping my sites, I'm going to serve them fake prices. Dynamically from the edge, I'm going to inject prices which are 10 times the actual price. Or if you're a financial services organization, someone is constantly coming and scraping your interest rates, as an example, you can choose to, to give them fake data. And a lot of that data can be cached on the Akamai edge and served from the edge. So you can cache prices for two days, as an example, for specific objects. So there is no load on your backend origin. And of course, I mean, if it's a fraudster trying to do any kind of credential abuse or any other action, then you can take, you can block them, you can serve them alternate, or you can signal to origin. So instead of using an Akamai action, you can just say, just send a signal back to me that you have detected a bot, and I will take the action at the origin. You might want to correlate the signal we send you with some backend transaction analytics that you have that we have no access to, and then take the action on the origin. So that's another uh, facility that's provided where we inject uh, a simple string called Akamai-bot into the header when we send the request back to the origin. And of course, if it's an unknown bot, uh, then you can use any wide variety of the six uh, different actions that we have. Now, Bot Manager as a solution was launched about 18 months back. Uh, but you know, as most things in security, the landscape has evolved. The sophistication of bots have evolved, and thus we have had to evolve our own solution, which I'll talk about. So when the bots, and you still see some of these simple bots, but the simple bots are coming typically from a single IP. Even if they are coming from multiple IP, they're not that many. They're not geographically that distributed. They have a low request rate. But as the sophistication increases, the bots try to impersonate as much as possible like an actual browser. So a, a full stack browser supports cookies, supports JavaScript. It has certain things which you can detect that, yeah, this request is coming from a browser, not from an automated script. All the way up to sophistication leading to being able to spoof the fingerprint of a browser to interacting with the site just like a human would. And, and this is the tra trajectory that we have uh, tried to follow uh, with the innovation that we are doing in Bot Manager. Now, when you look at the, the solutions that map to that sophistication, so we had, or we have, a WAF. A WAF can do GeoIP blocking, rate limiting, so the basic stuff it can allow and deny, but you know, for, for even the basic bots these days, that doesn't really work. So we launched Botman 1.0, and, and what it pretty much did was passively detect bots based on the fingerprint of the incoming request. How was the HTTP request formatted? We would look at those irregularities, and then we would detect. And we had some other detection mechanisms, which I'll talk about. Then we launched Botman 2.0, which did a bit more active detection. We would actually inject JavaScript into the browser and collect data to see whether is it an actual browser, is it a headless browser, uh, does it support cookies, and so on. To acquiring a technology from a company called CyberFend, which we integrated and launched as Bot Manager Premier, where we are able to uh, do even higher level of detection based on behavioral detection. Now, 
So far, until Botman 2.2, as I talked about, uh, we are looking at browser validation, automated browser, fingerprinting. We even do something called workflow validation. So let's say, for example, if you have a site, right, which is displaying prices or uh, it's displaying any kind of information, a typical human would go through a workflow. They would go to the main site, they would click on a menu, they would select the item, they would click next, and then they would arrive at the information that they're looking for. But a bot, as we have observed, they don't really follow that workflow. They will straight away jump to the exact page that they are looking for. And we can, you can actually define a workflow and say that, hey, if someone is not following this workflow and instead of going from step one, two, three, four, five, they're directly jumping to step five, then that's not a human. Because a human being is not going to format a URL exactly how it's supposed to be for the price page and land at that page specifically. So that's another thing you can do to detect bots. So now let's talk about CyberFed. And this is where we, where when we look at bots which are trying to interact with your site just like a human would, what are the things that we are looking at? So the, the concept is the same. We inject JavaScript into the page and we collect a lot of telemetry. And what this telemetry essentially is doing is collecting information on what is the interval between keystroke presses as, as someone is interacting with the site. If they are interacting using a mobile application or a mobile enabled site on a mobile device, what is the data from the accelerometer or gyroscope? How, how, how is that mobile device moving? How is the mobile device vibrating? What angle is it being held at? If it's a touch screen device, how, how is that interaction happening? Now, the, the main difference that we did, now if you look at uh, you know, when we were developing our bot manager solution, we were essentially going down the path of detecting more and more sophisticated bots, right? Now, what we realized is that hackers and bot operators are always going to try to outsmart us and stay a step ahead. So it again becomes a whack-a-mole game where we, we try to detect it, you know, they morph, they do something else. So we sort of switched it around completely. With the CyberFan technology, rather than trying to detect if an incoming request is a bot or not, we are trying to detect if it's a human or not. Because the way we interact as human beings with the site, that is the kind of behavior we are looking at. And I'll show a demo which kind of, which kind of puts that into uh, a bit more context of what I mean by that. While we're waiting for the demo, so why don't you guys get up and stand up a little bit? I know you guys are tired today. Just guys stand up, stand up. Why don't you guys introduce yourself to folks next to you if you guys don't know them already, and you know, have a quick stretch while the demo is getting sorted. Right. Come on, come on. I'll come around your table and help you guys. <laughs> you guys go talk. You guys know each other? You guys all on the same team? You guys go to the next table. Right? Just say hi to each other. Feel yeah. free. While they're sorry not demo, just go and say hi to the table next door. Table next door. Are you guys the same team as well? We know all. Hey, we're a community, right? It's a technology day, so everybody in the technology space, is, it's a really big community, right? So take the time to network and meet with each other. Table behind you, just feel free, just feel free. Space or something, share knowledge where you can. This is Mr. Ronak here. He's a team ID and Swayze or Kamish. Ronak. Maybe. Because I just met someone and he was from ID. And he's specifically from CBS. Oh. He must be from CBS. Yeah, maybe. Have you guys met? 
Do you guys have you guys met? You have. You met? What's the name? Uh, so two solutions. Uh, bot manager standard for your basic bots, which the use case is scraping, uh, content and price scraping, inventory grabbing. But whenever you have bots that are trying to do something transactional on your site, just as we discussed, creating fake registrations, doing credential abuse, account takeover, any kind of search which incurs cost at the back end, like a travel search, for example, uh, Botman Premier, which is, integrates the CyberFend technology to detect whether the behavior is human-like or not, is what uh, sort of we have come out with to help with the different scenarios that I talked about. Apologies for the demos again. Thank you. I want to make sure. get the speakers back on stage really quick. I want to start by thanking everyone attending today, allowing us at Akamai to actually share some of the innovations that we're bringing now, today, the future. But a lot has to do with the fact that you guys are providing feedback. So it's really important for you guys to provide feedback so that we can have you know, more robust, full, fruitful discussions in the next te technology day. But I also want to thank the speakers who are here today to share some of that knowledge. So we can give them a warm hand. <laughs> speak again. That'd be great. So we're going to have a cocktail session at 5.30. But why I got the speakers up here is, you know, you're going to get first hand. They're going to guide you back to the booth. And you guys can go and look at the demos, um, one, one, the bot manager demo, uh, back at the booth. But go ahead and take that time. But at Akamai, we want to thank everyone, our customers, for being here and being a customer. And, you know, giving us all the different feedback for where we are today, right? Thank you. All right, guys, I'm going to call it a wrap. And thank you again. And thank you for staying at Technology Day 2017, Mumbai. All right, guys.